Upsets early, chalk late. That's the story of the NCAA tournament so far, but will it continue? You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, folks? Happy Tuesday and welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, a daily national college hoop show. And we mean daily. Isaac and I have been on the ground recording every single night after each of these games throughout Thursday through Sunday. We are so excited to be doing it all again later this weekend as well. Uh, I'm your co-host, Andy Patton. He is Isaac Shade. I want to thank all of you for making this show your first listen or your first watch of the day. Remind you, you can check out the show ad-free on Amazon Music as well. Great place to go check out the show. We'll also want to shout out those everyday listeners who have been with us throughout the month of March, throughout all of 2024. Those of you who have even been with us for beyond that, we really appreciate you. And you can join us on our Discord channel as well. If you have not done so yet, it is free to join. There's a link in the show notes. We're hanging out talking hoops there 24-7. Today's episode of Lockdown College Basketball is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers who join today will get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more is a win. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Isaac, we got some superlatives to talk about some of our favorite matchups, favorite individual matchups, all sorts of stuff coming for the Sweet 16. We're also going to talk about the coaching carousel, three big moves on Monday, some big transfer portal names as well. All that stuff coming later in the episode. But we're going to start talking about the fact that in a season with so much parity, Throughout the regular season, we talked so much about how many times unranked teams beat ranked teams when they were hosting them. The ranked teams going on the road was a a massive talking point throughout the season. And yet, here we are in the Sweet 16, and Isaac is pretty darn chalky. We're not seeing a lot of those double-digit seeds. We're not seeing a lot of surprise teams here. It's generally the teams that you'd kind of expect to see in the Sweet 16 this year. Andy, it's so like, of course, the basketball gods did it this way, right? There was no other way to do it. Legitimately, though, I, I don't know how you were feeling coming in, but I legitimately thought, man, we've seen all of this upheaval. So mm-hmm. I was I was prepared for a wacky tournament. Yeah. And remember, you and I talked about this this weekend off air that the seed aggregate for the round of 32 was like one of the, what was it like? What did we say? Like the seventh highest. Yeah. Seventh highest. But then Cinderella just fell off a cliff Mm -hmm. in, in the round of 32. And now we have the sixth lowest sweet 16 seed aggregate ever. Like even that swing from one round to the next, Andy, not even just a regular season to this postseason. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like here's what people need to realize. Andy said it in the cold open that the phrase is upsets early chalk late. It's, it's exactly what all the TV execs are looking for. And Mm -hmm. frankly, it's what you and I should be looking for too, folks. Here's why we want to see the craziness early. We want to see the, the buzzer beaters, the wild raucous Mm -hmm. uh, jubilation. We want to see the shot of a 5,000 person gym back at home going Mm -hmm. nuts at Oakland or wherever is Jack Golke's going off. Like we want that in weekend one. But Andy, the truth of the matter, if we all look in the mirror and look at ourselves in the face, when we get to the Sweet 16 and beyond, we want the very best teams in the sport to be there. Why? Because it means great basketball games. And that's exactly what this tournament has delivered. And so while I know some people are sad that it's like, hey, look, in the in the round of 32, we had just two seed upsets in mm-hmm. good grief. It was a five over a four and a six over a three. So we can even barely call those <laughs> seed upsets. Um, and so we've got that one double digit seed in NC State. But Andy and everyone listening and watching, trust us when we say it as un- as disappointing as it is that there might not be Cinderella now, it's going to make for a better on-court product this weekend and beyond. Shout out to the Big 12, by the way. There was two upsets in the round of 32, and it was Kansas getting upset by Gonzaga and Baylor getting upset by Clemson. Again, those were upsets in a small sense of the world, uh, word of five over four. 
and a six over three. But yeah, the, the Big 12 didn't exactly show out as much as we might have thought they would here with only two teams remaining. But like you said, Isaac, as as chalky as we've seen in a really long time, all four one seeds still in the field here, all four two seeds still in the field. First time that's happened since 2019. We also got a pair of three seeds in Illinois and Creighton, pair of four seeds in Alabama and Duke, pair of five seeds in Gonzaga and San Diego State, one six seed that was Clemson, and then of course uh, our darling, the 11 seeded NC State, technically the biggest Cinderella of this group, although NC State is a you know traditionally strong basketball program coming out of the ACC, so not exactly a, a massive upset there. It's not you know the same as a VCU or a George Mason or anybody like that, but right. but I think to your point what that creates is really good basketball teams. Like NC state is a very good team. They finished 10th in the ACC. That says a little bit about the strength of the ACC. Obviously it also says a little bit about NC state playing much better now than they were playing throughout the majority of the season. But that's what makes it fun is like Marquette, you know, they're, they're the team that gets to draw an 11 seed, but they're not feeling as confident about that. Mm-hmm. As they might, if it was a, uh, you know, like one of Shaka Smart's previous teams at VCU when they were an 11 seed and making that run. So, uh, I'm excited for what's going to be some fantastic basketball. We, you know, we'll get to it later in the show, kind of picking our favorite matchups and our favorite individual matchups. And boy, like we, we could have picked ten each. Like there is so many fantastic uh, games and matchups and, and, and different storylines that are kind of going to come together here in what I think is going to be an incredibly exciting Sweet 16, even if. It didn't have, you know, the the plucky nine seed that beat a one seed and it didn't have, you know, a St. Peter's or anything like that. Still a lot of really good teams and a lot of really good matchups. Here's another big thing with it. Andy, you, you caught on uh, Sunday night a tweet from Jared Burson, who's one of the best college basketball stat tweeters out there, if I can call him that. Um, he said, and I hadn't, I had, I had, this hadn't hit my brain, Andy, yeah. that all five AP first team All-Americans are still in the Sweet 16. And what's cool is, and it makes sense when when you hear me say this, is that they're all spread out, one in each region, and then uh, two in another region. And it makes sense. It's all the one seeds and the two seed because to the the victors go the spoils, and that's what we're looking at. Um, And so, Andy, in the East, we've got Tristan Newton. In the West, we've got R.J. Davis. In the Midwest, we've got Zach Eady and Dalton Connect. And then in the South, we've got Jamal Shedd. So, Andy, uh, as as Burson said, that's the first time we've had such a thing in the Sweet 16 since 2006, almost two decades since that, which you would think that would happen more often. But but with all the unpredictability of the tournament, it it makes sense. But again, just another... Uh, check mark for it's going to be great basketball, Andy. I just absolutely love it. Yeah, and, and, and the conference affiliation was something we wanted to talk about too. We'll get to it a little bit briefly. There's uh, representation from all six of the Power Six conferences for now. Obviously, the Pac-12 uh, has a represent representative in Arizona. You also have a representative from the Mountain West in San Diego State and a representative from the WCC. I think there's a pretty strong argument that you're looking at maybe the top eight conferences in college basketball. Some may argue that the American or the A-10 uh, deserves to be ahead of the WCC. I'm not sure that that's a super strong argument. Obviously, all three of those conferences got two teams in the dance. The A, uh, the A10 went, I think, one and two. The AAC lost both their games. Uh, same areas, obviously, lost in the first round. But here, Gonzaga is nine years in a row in the Sweet 16. But the ACC is the is the the talk here, the storyline. They have four teams in the Sweet 16. 25 percent of those spots go to teams in a conference that was discussed throughout the year primarily for how not good they are, and they did not get very many bids, and they had a lot of teams on the bubble like Wake Forest, like Pitt, uh, and yet here they are with more, twice as many teams as the Big Ten, twice as many teams as the Big 12, twice as many teams as the SEC, and then the Big East, they go 3-0. Three, three, three no. All three of their teams uh, get into the dance here and, and make it to the Sweet 16. So uh, seven of the 16 spots go to the ACC and the Big East, and yet the big conferences, the ones that got a lot of the attention throughout the year, they don't have quite as much representation. And obviously people are going to see this, and there's going to be the argument that it's so much matchup-based and were you favorites or were you not. And I, I hear all that, but Andy, this has to be validation for the okay. ACC at some mm-hmm. level that despite – the computer metrics showing that conference 
to not be as strong. A lot of that is because of the bottom of the conference weighing it down. At the top end, the ACC has continued to deliver, both in terms of national champions and Final Fours and Sweet Sixteens, these last couple of years when they've not been as deeply good as they have historically. And I, I'm I'm happy to push directly back on that argument of the matchup based. I mean, Clemson beat a Big 12 team that was favored over them. NC State beat an SEC team that was favored over them. North Carolina beat a Big 10 team that was expected to be much better than they were. Duke didn't have to play the Big 10 team because they lost to a mid-major. Like, <laughs> I, you can't blame the ACC for, for being yeah. in the position that they're in. Like, yeah, NC State's in the Sweet 16 because they beat Oakland. Guess what? Oakland beat an SEC team. Like I, I just, this yeah. is not anybody the who's trying to push out of the back. SEC, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Anybody who's trying to push back on the ACC, like Word. I just, I, I you miss me with that argument. I, I don't see it. Like they, they all four of their teams deserve to be here, and they clearly proved it by either beating directly Power Six conference teams or somebody else beat that team and they beat that team. Either way, they are one hundred percent deserve their flowers for having four teams in the spot. Andy, that's a great word. If we're going to make that matchup argument, we got to get down into the weeds on it like you just did. Very well done. Now, as Andy mentioned earlier, we got some sweet superlatives for you. Which top seed is most likely to get upset before the Elite Eight? We got that and a look at some of our favorite individual matchups. All coming up in just a second. Right after I tell you this episode's brought to you by FanDuel. You know what? Say goodbye to those busted brackets. Say la vie. Because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even bet on who's going to win it all. Let me give you the top six teams in national championship odds at FanDuel. UConn, no surprise, plus 210. Houston and Purdue, both plus 600. Arizona, plus 850. Tennessee, 1100. And North Carolina at plus 1300. If you want to get in on any of that action, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Today's episode of Locked On College Basketball is also brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, patience. That's what brings home the winning trophy, and it's also what helps keep your ride or die alive. And eBay Motors has everything that you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts to choose from for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. Plus, with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your car every time or you get your money back because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that W. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, and eBay's guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. All right, Isaac, got, got some fun kind of superlatives that we want to talk about here. We're going to get more into the nitty gritty of, of previewing these individual matchups as we get kind of closer to the actual game. So look out for that on Thursday, Wednesday and Thursday's episodes. And then, of course, on Friday, we'll have our Thursday night. We'll go live and we'll have a, a recap of all the games there. But right make now, sure you hit that bell. Yeah, absolutely. Hit that bell. You'll be notified when we go live. Uh, we've been having a lot of fun with those live shows. So definitely, if you have not checked them out yet, do so. But we got some kind of fun just like – chatty things to talk about with some of these matchups. And I think we want to start with just like, what is your favorite game? There's Ooh. so many fun matchups that we, that we have, and we're going to get into some of the individual like player on player matchups, but just in terms of like, this is the game that I'm most excited to watch. Isaac, why don't we start with you? Which, which, which one stands out to you? Andy, this is this superlative right here is where what we just talked about really comes into play of we're going to get great basketball. That said, you and I both, as we were talking about this, had difficulty picking one because, as you said, there is so much. But for me, it is Illinois and Iowa State in the bottom half of the East region bracket. Why is that? Well, Illinois right now has jumped all the way up to number one at Ken Palm in offensive efficiency. They've passed Alabama. They are the number one team. It's come with that kind of switch to making Marcus Damask more of the kind of 
post up bully ball back down guy over Coleman Hawkins. And it's been this kind of revelation for them offensively. And you see what it's doing. Now we've got this two headed monster in he and Terrence Shannon Jr. It's so fun. But Andy on the other side, staring him in the face is TJ Otzelberger's Iowa State Cyclones, who, by the way, are number one in defensive efficiency. That's right. As soon as early as the Sweet 16, we've got number one offense against number one defense. I can't wait. I'm going to go with the other game in the East region there. UConn versus San Diego State. Weegin. The Weegin. Weegin. <laughs> UConn versus San Diego State, one seed versus five seed. But really the standout kind of narrative here is that these two teams played each other in the national championship last year. And that is the fourth time. This will be the fourth time that teams who were both in the national championship the previous year end up facing each other in wow. the following NCAA tournament. And Isaac, I noted this while putting the, the games in here. All of the three previous times this has happened, one of those two teams has gone on to win the national championship that year. Uh, the, the most recent time this happened was in 2007 when Florida played UCLA. Of course, Florida went on to then win the national championship. This happened again in 1991 when UNLV was coming off of their championship and they played Duke. And Duke, of course, went on to win the national championship that year. The first time that this happened was way back in 1962 when Cincinnati and Ohio State played each other. Cincinnati had won the previous year and won again that year. So two of the times that we've seen a repeat national champion, which does not happen very very often they had faced the team that they had played in the previous national championship. We have been talking a lot about whether UConn can do the thing that hasn't been done since <laughs> Billy Donovan coached that Gators team 15 years ago. Right. I'm not saying that this is like an omen or anything, but I'm also not saying that it's not an omen because this is a pretty rare thing to happen. I do believe UConn advances here. San Diego State is a good team. Jaden Ledee is fantastic, but I think he runs into a buzzsaw and a healthy Donovan Klingon. Yeah, yeah. uh, I'm curious how San Diego State, are they going to try to pull Klingon away from the rim? We know Ledee loves that kind of mid-post jump shot. I think Klingon can capably defend that. San Diego State has a great guard room, but can they handle Tristan Newton? Can they handle the floor spacing of Spencer and Caravan? Like, I, I think UConn's too much, and I think they advance, but I like the narrative of this being one of those very few uh, repeat matchups after a national championship. Okay, Andy, here's the that was a great category. Next one, likeliest, likeliest upset the Sweet 16. Likeliest upset in the Sweet 16. I'm going Clemson. I'm going Clemson over Arizona. This to me really stands out as a, a intriguing matchup. We've seen Tommy Lloyd's team struggle. Like this is not new for, for them. You know, they lost Oregon State. They lost to Stanford where they gave up 100. Occasionally they have game long defensive lapses and they're offensively elite. But I think Clemson, especially the way they have been playing lately, I think they can pick up a W here. Uh, I really like the PJ Hall versus Umar Balo matchup. And a lot of times when we pick like our favorite matchups, we're picking two similar type players. These two guys aren't really. And I think that's why I like this matchup. Uh, Hall can pull Balo away from the rim. Uh, he can, you know, he can make him defend in space, something that he's not particularly good at. We've seen PJ Hall hit threes and, you know, he's capable of doing that certainly. So that to me stands out as an interesting matchup. Obviously, Caleb Love is, is a complete load to defend. And if he's having one of his A-plus games, Clemson's going to really struggle uh, to, to stop him. But if he's not, I could see Clemson easily picking up a W here, potentially setting up what would be a very fun all-ACC matchup uh, in that in the West region between North Carolina and Clemson. Uh, of course, again, assuming Clemson or excuse, assuming Carolina gets by Alabama, uh, and that could set up a really fun matchup where one of those ACC teams is going to be in the Final Four. Yeah, I'm wondering how Clemson guards Caleb Love. I wonder if they have Chase Hunter on him. It'd be interesting yeah. to see. Anyway, I was picturing Hunter, but yeah, they could, could do a diff different things. Yeah. Um, Andy, that was actually, that would be my pick as well. So let me go with a different one that I also could see happening. Uh, by the way, same fan duel line in your game as it is in my game. Uh, the underdog here, I'm going to go with the other worst seeded ACC team, NC State over Marquette. Wolfpack is the underdog by six and a half points here. Andy, a big part of the reason for this is surely the uniqueness of DJ Burns in the post. Um, he is such a unique and difficult player to contend with. And in the course of the season, as, as you're ebbing and flowing, there've been times where he's, you know, he'll, he'll not show up as much, but mm -hmm. now at winning time, dude, he's been showing up over and over and over again. He's a big load of a man. This is why we wanted to see he and Eddie Lampkin mm -hmm. against each other from Colorado. But, um, he's the kind of guy that if you 
single cover him in the post, you're done. He'll yeah. just bump you until you're down unless you pull the chair and he falls, whatever you want to do. <laughs> but he's going to score in single coverage. You double him, he is their best passer. He doesn't lead them in assists, but he is their best passer. You double him, their outside dudes will absolutely burn you. DJ burns, but it's DJ Horn outside. He can nail it down, and he's not the only one. NC State has figured it out. Can they keep following this Kemba path? We'll see. But that, to me, is a very interesting upset to watch. One of the other things we want to talk about here is our favorite individual player-on-player matchups. And there is so many fun ones to pick. You could go Zach E.D. versus Graham E.K. You could go R.J. Davis versus... um, why am I blanking on who North Carolina? Oh, versus Mark Sears. That's a fantastic, <laughs> fun matchup there. But I'm going to go uh, out to the South region. I'm going to go with uh, Jeremy Roach and Jamal Shedd. Oh, yeah. Uh, two tough, two veteran guards, of course, Roach at Duke and Shedd uh, with Houston. And I think we're just looking at two really, again, veteran guards. They've both been around for a long time. They've played a lot of high-level basketball. Two really critical pieces to their team's uh, success, both individually and just as a team. Uh, Houston doesn't win if Jamal Shedd has a really bad game. Duke maybe can survive it a little bit, but they really need Roach to be the straw that stirs the drink. Uh, Roach coming off of what it was a pinky injury of some kind in that James Madison game. We'll see if he's operating at 100%. Shed coming off of that exhausting overtime <laughs> game against Texas A&M. Uh, these are two two of the most fun guards to watch in college basketball, and I think the matchup between the two of them is going to be a huge storyline to watch in that Duke-Houston game. Uh, the individual matchup I'm looking for is in that national championship rematch, Andy, that you talked about between Donovan Klingon and Jaden Ledee. Donovan Klingon, man, now, as you mentioned, now he's healthy. The, the numbers he's putting up, dude, against Stetson in round one, 19 points on nine of 11 shooting, eight boards, four assists. Then against Northwestern, 14 points, 14 rebounds, eight stinking blocks. Jaden Ledee's doing the same kind of stuff. He's, I think it's 32 and 26, yeah. if I remember the numbers right, right. what Ledee has done. These two dudes in the post, just watch it. It's one of those where I'm like, please, none of you get in foul trouble so that we can keep watching this back and forth the entire game. I don't know that San Diego State has enough elsewhere, but in that individual matchup, boy, will it be fun. Wanted to quickly look at the most exciting potential Elite Eight matchups that we could see, and the one that I picked here would require two upsets. But if we see Gonzaga upset Purdue, which we didn't mention as a potential upset option, but it is definitely plausible at least that it could happen uh, and Creighton and Tennessee, which is technically an upset, but those two teams are very evenly matched. We could see a Gonzaga Creighton matchup in the elite eight. Uh, the Ryan Nemhart storyline is the reason I picked this one here. Ryan Nemhart, of course, somewhat surprisingly transferred from Creighton to Gonzaga this off season. Uh, Creighton was not expecting to lose their starting point guard who was playing 35 minutes a game for a team that went to the elite eight. Uh, I think there's going to be some, some, animosity perhaps uh, in that game if this matchup were to happen. Uh, Nemhard's been obviously an incredibly critical piece for Gonzaga. So if we were to get Gonzaga Creighton, this is also a a group of teams that have played each other in the NCAA tournament before. Uh, They were one of the teams Gonzaga beat on their way to the national championship in 2021. There's history between these programs. They've had transfers between the two programs before. Ryan Nampart is a big storyline. Uh, and also, these are just two really elite offenses, and I think it would be an incredibly fun basketball game sans all the other storylines. Uh, so that would be my, my most exciting potential matchup we could see uh, in the Elite Eight. Andy, for me, it's the one that probably everybody and their brother circled the second the bracket came out, seeing that North Carolina and Arizona are in the same bracket. It's the one that everyone wanted to see come to fruition. Who knows if it will, because they've both got tough matchups on Thursday. But North Carolina against Caleb Love and Steve Robinson, who used to be an assistant coach in the Roy Williams era at North Carolina, coming back together. It would be like this for North Carolina. It would be the second time in three years that they've had an oh my goodness matchup in the NCAA tournament when they faced Duke two years ago. Mm -hmm. Who was it that hit that big game winning shot that's iconic? Caleb Love. So, Andy, what an absolute ridiculous matchup that would be. All right, we're going to go off the NCAA tournament for a little bit and inexplicably into the transfer portal and some coaching carousel news because for some reason the transfer portal is already open. That's a conversation for another day. But the portal is in action already. But right now, the coaching carousel is the biggest part of this conversation. Three Power Six programs made big moves on Monday. We'll unpack it for you in just a second. 
right after I tell you this episode is brought to you by Nissan. And here comes that bracket highlight from March Madness from them. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest. Just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs, these guys were able to take it to the next level. The North Carolina Tar Heels can only be described as an armada. This one seed is as hardcore as it gets out there. So it's no wonder they secured a spot in the Sweet 16 this Thursday against Alabama in the NCAA tournament. They're a favorite picked by many to make a run for a national championship. So take the Nissan Rogue, Pathfinder, or Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Andy, throughout the course of Monday morning, we learned of three different coaching carousel moves. I believe I have them in chronological order from when they were released in our notes here. Uh, the first of which is Kyle Smith, who uh, is going to Stanford from Washington State. So that means, Andy, he's leaving the West Coast Conference to join the ACC. Uh, so, Andy, what, what do you first off? What, let, let's talk about these each individually, just in passing a little bit here. What do you what do you like about this hire? Yeah, Kyle Smith's a phenomenal coach, and he has been a phenomenal coach while coaching at programs that don't often have a lot of resources. He was great at Columbia. He was great at San Francisco. He was great at Washington State. None of those are, are high-resource, big-money institutions. Washington State, uh, one of the most difficult Power Six programs up to this point uh, to recruit at ever. Uh, they're in Pullman, Washington. They don't have a ton of money allocated to men's basketball. Like, it's a really tough place to, to win. And he won this year in particular after losing a ton of talent from last year's roster in the transfer portal. He had his best player go to Villanova. Villanova didn't make the tournament. Washington State did. Like that is DJ Rodman went from Washington State to USC, said, I'm leaving a program that's rebuilding because I want to win a championship in my last year. He didn't make the tournament. Washington what? State did. That is a testament to Kyle Smith's ability to coach. And now he goes to Stanford. Stanford's not, a, they're not allocating a ton of money to basketball either. They never, that's just never been a thing that they've done. Jared Haas tried so hard to get that program. He recruited really well there and just could not get them over the hump uh, in his seven years at the helm there. Uh, but, but Kyle Smith, I think, can. I think he's capable of leading this team to heights that we haven't seen from Stanford in a long time. I think this is a home run hire. Uh, I think it's, uh, Stanford's got a, they're riding a lot on this because they missed out on the opportunity to hire Mark Madsen, uh, a former Stanford alum who is now a coach at Cal after being really successful at Utah Valley. So I think for Stanford, they really needed to knock this one out of the park. And frankly, I think they did with Kyle Smith. Andy, the next uh, one up on the list is Danny Sprinkle to Washington. You had been talking about this as the expectation for a while. Sure enough, it happened. He had spent four years at Montana State in the big sky where, look, they won off. They had a winning record all four years, literally one year at Utah State, where who did he get back? Freaking nobody, Andy. Yeah. He had nobody to work with. He gets guys like great Osibor, which has been unbelievable for him. Uh, this is going to be really interesting for Danny Sprinkle uh, to go up to Washington. But uh, there's a little bit of inner Washington news that makes this interesting. Yeah, Danny Sprinkles from Pullman, from, from the same town, of course, as Washington State. Uh, never really thought that was realistic. Why would he leave the a team that finished in the first place in the Mountain West to a team that's going to the WCC? And realistically, Washington State, is they're in a really tough spot. They lose their coach, Kyle Smith, which I think they kind of thought was going to happen. They never really got a chance at Danny Sprinkle. I mean, this was announced like an hour later, uh, and I don't think he would have done it anyway because – Good coaches don't want to go to a team that, I mean, no disrespect to the WCC, but they're also only in it for two years. And then their future after that is unknown. That's you right. don't know if you're joining a program that's going to be in the WCC for decades, if they're going to be in the Mountain West, if they're going to create a new conference, like if they're going to, if everything's going to just fall apart and they're going to go to the ACC and do this nightmare travel that Stanford and Cal are doing. Like there are a lot of potential, or they could like somehow get incredibly lucky and end up in the Big 12. I don't think that's likely, but like you don't know. So if you're a coach right now, I wouldn't leave a Mountain West school to go coach at Washington State. I, I don't know who they're going to get. I feel kind of bad for Wazoo because they're coming off a really good year. They were a seven seed and people felt that was underseeded. And now they're going to struggle to find somebody to replace uh, to replace Kyle Smith. And, and that, I mean, it sucks. It just sucks for this program. Uh, and I want them to be good because I want it to help elevate the, the level of the WCC. But uh, they're going to have a hard time finding a coach who's willing to, to put up with all of this. And then Andy, the third news of the day was Mark Byington, who had Byington, excuse me, who had spent all those years at Georgia Southern. This was his fourth year at James Madison, makes the tournament for the first time, started the season off by beating Michigan State, 
<clears throat> and then starts off the uh, NCAA tournament by beating another Big Ten team. So really good stuff from Mark Byington. Ultimately, he is leaving and will head to Vandy to replace Jerry Stackhouse. Obviously, another tough place to play. It's SEC school, so money's going to be coming in, but it's going to be a tough job to have to rebuild there. Andy, let's quickly mention also a couple portal names uh, that popped up on Monday. We've got the offspring of somebody that played at one of the bluest blue bloods in the nation. Jamal Mashburn Jr., star at New Mexico. He had some injury issues this year, which was unfortunate because I thought he yeah. was going to be a guy who could have dropped 20 plus per game. I think he only averaged about 14. Part of that was his backcourt mate, Jalen House, was also fantastic. But Jamal Mashburn Jr., he enters the transfer portal. His dad, Jamal Mashburn, was an NBA All Star, also played at Kentucky. Uh, we'll have a lot more conversation about John Calipari on a future episode. Uh, obviously, there's some angst right now on whether he's even going to stick around in Lexington. I'll tell you what, if he can find a way to commit Jamal Mashburn Jr. to that team to help replace Antonio Reeves. That's going to help him yeah. in a big, big way. The other name here, Michi Johnson, enters the transfer Speaking portal. Speaking of the Kentucky, Cal they beat Kentucky. Yeah, this that's year. right. Yeah, they did. Uh, Michi Johnson enters the portal, a leading scorer for South Carolina. Ohio State's NIL collective retweeted it with eyeballs, which just, it's just, we're just in a weird time in college athletics. We don't have time to get all the way into it, but like NIL collectives retweet, like, very blatantly trying to, I don't know. It's just a bizarre thing. It's not against the rules, but I don't know if it should be or, or what, but it's, it's, we're in an odd time. The fact that this is happening while the NCAA tournament's happening, like it's just, it's the wild, wild West. And I know that's kind of an overused phrase about college basketball right now, but it really feels like it with the amount of different topics and, and storylines that are all happening uh, congruently. And we here on Locked On College Basketball, we're going to do our best to bring you <laughs> everything that we can. I, I've said this before. If, if coaches have to focus on the transfer portal and their jobs and the NCAA tournament, we're going to try in solidarity to do the same here and talk about the portal, talk about the coaching changes, talk about the NCAA tournament. We're going to come back your way on Wednesday with a bigger preview game by game of these Sweet 16 matchups uh, as we get into those games starting, of course, on Thursday afternoon. Uh, and then on Friday as well, we're going to be live with you every night that there are games for the rest of of the season. Want to thank all of you so much who have made this show your first listen or your first watch of the day. Reminder to join us on that Discord channel. Reminder to hit that bell so that you get notified when we go live and when we post new episodes. Uh, but Isaac, until next time, apologies to the lawyer family, even if we didn't talk much about Purdue. Let's go Wildcats. Got one of them still playing. And until tomorrow, peace.